Welcome everyone um, to today's um, class on risk management in banks. Uh, this is um, um, a short um, summary of uh, what uh, risk management looks like in uh, banks. Uh, if you're more interested in this topic, uh, you might have seen that we also have uh, the financial risk management class uh, each uh, summer semester and also uh, one or two lectures in quantitative and operational risk management uh, at the master's level. So if you're more interested in this topic, please feel free to um, look at the videos uh, that are also available on YouTube. Um, today, I'm only giving you a short, very short, hopefully concise summary of what risk management looks like um, in banks. And we need to talk about risk management because as we have probably all seen by now, um, banks are exposed to numerous risks um, and we need to manage these risks because otherwise we'll be facing uh, heavy heavy financial losses uh, as we go on with our commercial investment banking activities so let's start out um, with a definition of risk management and for that we need to define what risk is um, risk is usually at least in our context um, understood as financial losses um, if you look at it more generally, you can also say it always uh, risk is always the uncertainty about the occurrence of something adverse happening, something that is undesirable. And uh, more generally, we could say uh, the occurrence of possible environmental conditions um, as a result, uncertainty concerning specific business goals. We have some uh, business goals. We have some, uh, some, uh, for example, some. Uh, aims, um, some profit uh, goals we have, and we are missing those goals. So that could be risk uh, in a very general sense. Could also be a deviation of a parameter from its expected target value. But in this class and usually throughout finance, um, risk is understood as, at least in risk management, as the random, a random negative deviation of financial um, variables from previously defined reference values of asset positions. So we have an asset um, or any financial position. We expect this position to have a certain value. And as soon as uh, the true value of that financial position, usually in the future, might deviate from that expected value, uh, and usually in a negative way, um, we have what we call risk. Uh, in risk theory, we have a more uh, we have a finer distinction between the different types of randomness and risk and uncertainty. Uh, why is that uh, necessary? Well, in risk manage no in risk theory, you can distinguish um, certain situations. You could say uh, we start out with certainty. You have five dollars. Oh no, dollars. Um, you can then move on to uh, uncertainty in the sense that you might have four dollars or six dollars you have no information about probabilities uh, you might have a situation where you say four dollars p equal to 40 percent and six dollars with 60 percent probability this is what in risk theory we would consider to be risk you know what happens or what could happen four and six euros and you know the probabilities for these two events but you don't know which of these events will happen but you do know which is possible which events are possible and you do know the probabilities. so this is usually what in risk theory um, and decision theory we would consider to be a risk this is uncertainty and it might also be in a completely different way it could also be that we know nothing that's complete uncertainty and we don't even have um, the different possibilities no we don't it could be three could be eight could be zero dollars um, so these are the different types of uncertainty of randomness of risk but uh, in a strict sense this is what we would consider a risk um, in decision and risk theory and it's the same thing we are uh, looking at here as well in financial risk management so we have financial positions we have an expected value and usually negative deviations, but they are always random, um, random negative deviations of these financial positions. This is what we consider risk. What are the characteristics of risk then? It needs to be random. 
deterministic results do not represent risk. If it's deterministic, if we know that we are facing a loss, you don't consider it in risk management, you will include it on your balance sheet. Usually negative deviations. Well, a positive deviation is an unexpected profit. That is nice, but we don't really need to deal with this in risk management. I'll give you an example where you should see that sometimes extremely high and unexpectedly high profits can also pose a risk. It should be financial. We are looking at financial institutions, financial risks. So we don't really care about strategic risk or sometimes even reputational risk. Um, that is unfortunate for the company, but usually nothing we can really um, manage in risk management. And ideally, it should be measurable. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples where you can see how uh, multifaceted uh, risk can be. So first, the fall of Barings Bank PLC. And this is the discussion are only negative deviations or only losses. Do they pose a risk? First counter example is British investment bank Barings Bank. Uh, was founded in the 18th century, rather old investment bank in the UK. And in 1995, it went bankrupt overnight uh, due to unauthorized speculations with derivatives by a single trader of the bank, Nick Leeson. Not Liam, but Nick Leeson. They're not related to each other. Uh, and what happened was that this rogue trader, unfortunately, there's a fixed term. There's a, uh, there's a term for this uh, rogue trader. Uh, this rogue trader, Nick Leeson, um, he kept two separate accounts, one for his profits and one for his losses. He only reported uh, the profits and was able to hide the financial losses from his superiors. And he got promoted to, I think, chief derivatives trader in the Singapore branch of um, Barings Bank. What then happened was he piled up losses over losses and only reported the profits. But in 1995, um, after adding profits and losses to two separate accounts, taking on large risks and reporting high profits to superiors. He got promoted. And what then happened is um, in 1995, we had the Great Hanshin earthquake in Kobe and Osaka in Japan. And that uh, drove um, the Asian stock markets uh, into a, a negative spiral. It caused them to lose uh, a lot of money. And he was no longer able to hide those financial losses. So he fled the country and later on, he eventually was uh, arrested by German police at Frankfurt Airport. Um, and you can see that this is a good example. It's a counter example for the idea that only losses matter. If superiors had questioned those high profits, they was able to report throughout his career. They should have seen that something was off. It was too good to be true. So yes, usually, and after these next two slides, we'll concentrate on financial losses. But you always have to keep in mind that it's also sometimes suspicious if someone is only reporting high profits and if it's too good to be true. The second example, second counter example is Bernie Madoff. He was the inventor of the largest Ponzi scheme in the United States. A Ponzi scheme uh, is a, a kind of, we, in German we call this a snowball system, a snowball scheme, Schneeball system. In, in, in English it's called a Ponzi scheme. Why? What is a Ponzi scheme? It's uh, the idea illegally, usually this is illegal, um, if you are running a fund, he was running a fund, an investment fund, uh, you ask for, let's say, $100 from investors. And usually you would invest it and maybe earn a return of 3%. Um, you have uh, maybe a 0.5% uh, cost. And then the return to your investors is 2.5%. What Bernie Madoff did is he took the 100 from his investors and he didn't invest it. Uh, he simply, let's say he took 2% cost and he paid out, uh, let's say, 8% to investors. Um, and how did he get the additional 10 euros? Because he didn't invest this. Um, he took it out, out of the 100. 
So he was left with only 90, but in the next round, uh, investors saw that he was able to beat the market. He was able to pay 8% in contrast to 2.5%. Uh, a normal fund would only pay. So suddenly people came and gave him, let's say, $1,000. Um, and then he again took out 2 or 3%, let me make 3% cost, 8% uh, again to investors. And he paid out the returns to his investors from the new fund inflows of new investors. He never invested this money. And this is the Ponzi scheme. And as you can see, this only works if the snowball gets larger and larger. Problem was that at some point the financial crisis happened. And during the financial crisis, all those investors wanted their money back and Bernie and Madoff didn't have any money. Uh, and this lost investors 65 billion US dollars. And a whistleblower at that time said, the biggest tip off of a fraud was that Madoff reported his fund was down only three months out of 87, whereas the S&P 500 was down 28 months during the same period. And well, that's pretty easy. If you don't invest, in this sense, you cannot lose. And if you only pay out the interest and the return to your investors from the new inflows of new investors, there is no chance of you go, uh, going down with your fund as long as new investors uh, keep pouring into your fund. So again, it was too good to be true. So every time as a risk manager, you see something is off, even if it's a positive uh, deviation, if it's a profit, be suspicious and then um, you might see a risk as well. Now, how to measure financial risk? Uh, we can start by looking at data, like for example, the S&P 500. Uh, this is um, the index. As you can see, between 95 and 2015, it went up, had a crisis, went up again, financial crisis, went up, it probably went like this, COVID, and it's gone up again. So it probably looks like this. How should we measure financial risk? Well, one idea is to look at prices, but what do prices tell you? It's not a very good uh, proxy for risk. Uh, an easy way of measuring risk would be to consider the volatility. Now with the S&P 500, it's very simple to look at the volatility of that index because we have the um, VIX index, the volatility index that is a traded index on the volatility of the S&P 500. And not surprisingly, uh, you can see, let me just see if I can, yes. Yes, That's exactly. Okay, it seems I don't get the eraser. Okay, I can't really use my my system here, and my program. I wanted to erase the red line, but as you can see, uh, especially during this time and this time, we have high series, uh, times of high volatility. And not surprisingly, let's see, yes, this looks pretty good. This is the financial crisis, and this is the dot-com uh, bubble. Uh, and 9-11, and this is also the burst of the economy bubble, new economy bubble. And um, well, you could use the volatility to measure risk. Uh, we'll later on learn how to measure risk in different ways. But um, just this is one index, one investment, and there are numerous ways of measuring risk. For example, again, uh, looking at prices, go up and down. Uh, you can take the log returns, the continuously compounded log returns. Uh, they are less and more volatile. So this could be a way of measuring risk. Uh, we can have a look at the absolute returns. Uh, this looks pretty much like the volatility. Um, we can immediately concentrate on the volatility. For volatility, you need uh, this is done actually uh, using a rolling window, estimation window. Um, you need to have a statistical model to estimate the volatility. And then you can also look at the um, log returns below a quantile, for example, the 5% quantile. If this is the distribution of those log returns, 
then maybe this is the 5% quanta, meaning that you have 5% of probability mass in this area and 95 in here. And you only look at those returns that are to the left of the 5% quantile. And then this is the plot of those log returns below the 5% quantile. You can do the same for the log returns below the 10% quantile. And you can see you have more observations that lie below the 10% quantile because probably this would be these returns. Okay. Um, can do the same thing uh, with the log returns above the 90% quantile, but then these would be profits. These would be profits, for example, at almost 11% profit on one day. Uh, same with the 95% quantile. Um, it depends on your preferences. It depends on the wishes of the risk manager, what kind of risk measure you want to use to measure financial risk. Now then, what's risk management? Risk management is understood as the set of all measures for the specific identification, measurement, management and controlling of risks in a company. Could be a financial institution, could be an insurance company, bank, but can also be industrial companies like, for example, um, an energy company and the environment relevant to the firm. And the primary goal of risk management is and has to be the stabilization and ideally increasing shareholder value. You can think about a lot of things, um, missing out on losses, preventing financial losses, um, controlling the exposure to financial losses, to risk, etc., etc. But in the end, it's always about shareholder value. If it's not about shareholder value, you have some misalignment of your incentives in your company and obviously misaligned uh, incentives for management. So stabilize and ideally increase shareholder value usually understood as the market value of equity. Now, risk management is a continuous process. It's not something you do once at the start of uh, the company's uh, life cycle, but it's done continuously every day, uh, especially in a bank. It's a central management task. That means it cannot be delegated. Just a typo here. It's to be together. Um, it's, um, it's a continuous process. It cannot be delegated. Yes, you will get um, um, external consultants uh, from time to time uh, to help you with setting up risk management. But most of the time, risk management is a central function uh, in the management and headquarters of your company. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the risk management process. Identification, measurement, um, no, measurement, management, and controlling and reporting of risks. So you've seen what management is and management is always you have a problem, you identify potential solutions to that problem. You have to assess what uh, these strategies entail. You have select, you have to select a strategy, do it, perform the strategy and then check whether this uh, solution to your problem was satisfactory. It's the same in risk management. We have to identify our problem. What are those risks we are exposed to? We have to measure those risks. How large is the exposure? We then need to manage these risks. So how can we ideally deal with the relevant risks? And then controlling and reporting. First of all, we have to check whether we have solved our problem. Have we reduced our risk exposure? What needs to be done? Has it been done? What needs to be changed? And then we have to communicate and we have to report our results to our internal and external stakeholders, which are top management, CEO, chief risk officer, but also accountants, auditors, uh, tax accountants, uh, the government, um, financial supervisors and regulators, uh, even actuaries and insurance companies. So everyone needs to be in and uh, investors, obviously. Uh, so everyone who has a stake in the company needs to be for, informed about the measures taken in risk management and what are the results. So let's start with risk identification. First step in risk management is identifying all possible risks. We have to differentiate between internal and external risks. Sometimes with internal risks, the reason and the source of risk lies within our company. For example, illegal behavior of employees. Sometimes we cannot do anything about the source of risk because it's an external adverse effect that um, 
affects our company, for example, changes in exchange rates, market prices, etc. The decision of the risk manager is then which risks are relevant to the company and could have a significant adverse effect on the company's financial situation. Now, what you will see many times, even in small companies, and this is very uh, common in energy companies, that you will see something called risk matrix or risk map. What happens is that you do something like this, And you have the probability on the x-axis and the potential loss on the y-axis. You can also switch it. And what then happens is, for example, you say this is let's do it like this. Weird. Um, Maybe zero to smaller than twenty percent. I need to make this a little bit smaller. Sorry. Uh, I have to delete this. Come on. Six uh, smaller than twenty percent, and maybe then smaller than forty percent, smaller than sixty percent, uh, and you you can imagine where it goes from here. And here you say uh, zero to one million dollars, uh, one to five million dollars and five to 20 million dollars and so on and then you would say okay i have identified a risk and it's now uh, isn't there anything let's let's use this one it's very rather uh, actually quite large we have a risk here we have a risk here uh we have a risk here and then you can calculate sorry for that you can calculate the expected loss of these risks and as you can imagine if you have a risk up here this is highly relevant if you have a risk that is uh, extremely probable but only comes at a very small potential loss or if you have some risk here it might not be relevant so the risk manager has to decide which are the risks that are relevant to the company, which are significant. And it might even be that even though you know about risk, you're not dealing with it in risk management. You only report about it in the risk uh, report, uh, in the risk management part of your annual report. And then you don't do anything about that risk because it's such, it's just so improbable. Now, numerous risks are likely to be known beforehand. For example, you know that if you're a bank, you're always subject to the risk that grounded loans may default. In many cases, this is not the case. Uh, many cases, you don't know um, about those risks. You have to make sure that you identify those risks. Uh, a pretty good example for this is uh, Fukushima Daiichi, uh, the um, nuclear um, meltdown at Fukushima power plant. Uh, why? Everyone knows in Japan that, well, you do have earthquakes in Japan. Uh, people knew about this beforehand, but no one really thought about the danger of an earthquake taking place in the ocean, causing a tsunami and the tsunami wave uh, breaking the power plant's uh, cooling system. So even though you were aware of the risk of an earthquake, the plant itself, the power plant itself was earthquake proof, but it wasn't tsunami proof. So even these things, well, in, in hindsight, you always know what was best and what did work and what did not work. So yes, we usually know those risks. Uh, we know about these risks, but sometimes even large companies miss out the obvious. So this happened, unfortunately, with the Fukushima, Fukushima Daiichi uh, disaster. 
The second step in risk management is measuring or valuating, valuing all the previously identified risks. You will resort to quantitative risk management in many cases. You'll use a statistical uh, distribution, financial mathematics, actuarial methods. Sometimes you also use qualitative risk management, which means that you don't get numbers, you don't get numerical um, um, measurements for your risks, but you resort to things like expert judgments, expert interviews, just in many cases, just to make sure that you at least identify those risks that you might be exposed to. The third step is to determine how to deal with the risks. You need to manage these risks and some possible strategies are complete avoidance, risk reduction, risk transfer or risk mitigation. And we have all these. Um, yeah, uh, let me just see. We don't have it in here. It's uh, in more detail actually in the financial risk management class. Um, but I can um, I can say a couple of uh, words on each of these strategies. Very simply, complete avoidance is n not doing the business at all. You you complete it, uh, you avoid it completely. For example, you don't close a deal, you don't give out a loan. If the risk is too high, you will simply avoid the risk. Then risk reduction, for example, could be uh, entering a hedge contract or by diversification. Risk transfer is very simple to buy an insurance contract. If you buy insurance, you're not changing the risk per se. It stays the same, but you're simply transferring it to another market participant. And then you can also mitigate risk, for example, by setting up limits. In case of these rogue traders, uh, limit systems would have been nice and they would have prevented those companies to pile up such high losses. Last but not least, risk control. Uh, you need to improve your risk measurement and risk management systems. That is, you have to review all those identified risks. Uh, in many cases, especially in smaller companies, the risk manager will ask uh, company employees and section heads, what has happened during this year? Have you identified all relevant risks? Did something unexpected uh, happen? Are you satisfied with the risk management assessment you've done? Uh, do we need to change anything? So you have to review the identified risks, the adequacy of your quantitative models, as well as the risk measures and the adequacy of those risk measures. And then if you see um, the necessity for improvements, Yes, you have to change your methods and you have to uh, check your instruments. And this is done on a frequent basis. Many companies, especially the smaller ones, have um, a special risk management cycle that, for example, they ask in the they, they ask section heads each year once uh, at one specified point in time. Uh, please check the risk inventory, this Risiko Inventar in German, your, your risk inventory. Is it still accurate? Is it still current? Do we need to add some certain risks? Maybe it's actually very, um, very practical to think about like this. You see something happening uh, in the newspaper. For example, you're an energy company. You see Fukushima Daiichi happening and you as a risk manager, you think, could this happen to me as well? And you start running around in your company and asking engineers, are you sure that our power plants are safe and are not exposed to this kind of um, risk? Then usually, at least in Germany, I would think they say, well, we don't have any risk of an earthquake, so especially not of a tsunami. So we don't have any risk. We don't have to change the risk inventory in risk management. So that's risk controlling. And then as a last step of the risk management process, we need to report this to our managing board, to managers, supervisory board, uh, super financial supervisors, and even auditors, actuaries, and investors. Okay, now this is the risk management process. We start out by identification. We go to measurement, risk controlling, and checking the adequacy of our models and then reporting it to our stakeholders. And it's, it's a cycle. Okay. Now let's now turn to the different types of risk uh, we have um, and um, we will usually see in banking. Now we start out with financial risk. We also have real economic risk, but we'll concentrate on financial risks. Financial risks can be defined as those risks that originate in the investment 
and financing activities of a company and thus in its interaction with financial markets. And it's not surprising that with financial institutions, this is the basically the only type of risk we are really concerned about because all our positions, all our business is in finance. It's in the interactions with financial markets, in financial contracts. Uh, these financial risks often arise from changes in market prices, not necessarily, but market price risk is, of course, uh, a large risk type uh, on our balance sheet. The defaults of loans from trade receivables, loans granted, can also lead to financial losses. And last but not least, inadequate liquidity, uh, liquidity can also endanger our um, company life um, and uh, the existence and maybe lead to bankruptcy. So these are financial risks in contrast to real economic risks. Now let's now turn to the 2017 risk report of Deutsche Bank. Um, banks are required by regulators uh, and supervisors to report extensively on their risk management, on their risk exposure. And here you can see the risk profile from the risk report in 2017 of Deutsche Bank. Uh, they distinguish between credit risk, market risk, operational risk, business risk and a diversification benefit. And in the end, they have a total economic capital usage of close to, I think this should be in million, yes, 27 billion euros. Um, now, what does it mean? Um, and why is it measured by economic capital? It's a very simple idea. Um, how should you measure risk? Uh, let's start with a very simple, let me see when I have some space to write. This is good. Let's start with a toy model of a bank's balance sheet. We have the assets and the liabilities here. And let's assume we get um, 1000 in equity. Now our total assets is 1000. We now want to give out loans. Um, very simple. Uh, idea would be simply to say we give up one thousand dollars euros in loans then we have our balance sheet and we are done now this would mean that if one loan defaults we as a shareholder we are losing one thousand uh, dollars in equity that will be okay now let's imagine uh, we t we are a bank. Don't forget, we are a bank. We take in nine thousand dollars in deposits. If we were now to give out ten thousand dollars in loans, this is tricky from a financial stability standpoint and from a regulatory standpoint. We have to keep in mind. Well, um, what is happening here? I need to change the total assets here. We have to keep in mind that as a regulator, uh, we've seen this with minimum reserves. Um, we want to make sure that if the bank faces a financial loss, if a loan defaults, um, the deposits at least are safe. Now, you can see here that if this happens, um, well, we have some equity, but we don't want those loan defaults to uh, break into the deposits. But is it likely, is it probable that all $10,000 in loans will default? No. What we will say is, uh, we will, for example, say, well, um, let's first of all calculate what we say is our risk weighted, sorry, weighted assets. We would say that, for example, uh, we expect 5% losses on those loans. So our risk weighted assets will be 5% times 10, uh, 10,000 in loans. So it will be 500. On the other hand, we see we have equity um, and we will then say, I have to insert it here, we will say that we call this risk capital also 
aka economic capital, which is 1000. And now we can see that risk weighted assets are smaller than economic capital. And in this sense, we would, in this situation, we would say, well, bank, this is fine. You have risk weighted assets that are lower than the available economic capital. And in this way, we could also say, well, you can give out more loans. If you still have some capital, if you still have some cash, you can give out more loans and you can raise, if you get more deposit, you can still give out loans. If, however, we would say that, for example, um, we have given out more risky loans and let's say this is 15%, then we would have risk weighted assets of 1,500. And then this would mean that risk weighted assets are larger than economic capital. And this would mean that regulators or supervisors, supervisor will step in and the supervisor will prevent the bank from giving out additional loans because the risk weighted assets are too high. In other sense, the risk on the balance sheet of the bank is too high. Now, what you can see here is um, you can say this is risk weighted assets or you can also say we want to measure the required or needed. What is the required? economic capital for this asset position. And this is why on this slide, you can see the required, the necessary economic capital or the economic capital usage for the asset positions for the risk weighted assets on the balance sheet of Deutsche Bank. So they were in need of 27 billion dollar, uh, euros to cover the risk weighted assets on the asset side of their balance sheet. Is that clear? This is actually a very, very important um, uh, concept uh, because you can actually use economic capital or risk capital. Uh, an alternative um, name for this is actually, let me just add this. This is also called AKA regulatory capital, regulatorisches Kapital, ökonomisches Kapital oder Risikokapital. This is a very, very important concept in banking and banking supervision and regulation. Why? Because you will have extensive rules um, on the asset and the liability side of the balance sheet of a bank to uh, calculate the required economic capital and the risk weighted assets. Any idea? What happens on the right hand side to calculate economic capital? And this is why it's not simply equity. Very simple idea. Regulatory capital. Not equal to equity. Why? Regulatory capital includes certain parts of debt. Any idea why you can, why regulators allow banks to include certain parts of debt to be uh, included in regulatory capital? Any idea? Regulators and financial supervisors think about the likelihood that the bank has to pay back um, debt immediately in case of a default. So every type and every component of debt and your liabilities that is not immediately due for repayment can at least to some extent be included in regulatory capital. For example, German Renachrang Darlehen, which is uh, a debt, which is a liability 
uh, that is not um, that in, that is uh, not senior, that is not due to repayment immediately in case of bankruptcy, but which is closer to default. So mezzanine financing uh, is also um, partly included in uh, regulatory capital. Ich frage da nochmal auf Deutsch. Ist das jedem klar geworden, äh, was der Unterschied zwischen regulatorischem Kapital und Eigenkapital ist und dass das nicht das gleiche ist? Wenn nicht, dann sollte es allen jetzt klar sein und dann setze ich das voraus. Wunderbar. So as you can see from the risk profile, risk exposure is often measured by the economic capital usage and uh, it is tradition since Basel II, uh, I'll come back to this later, uh, to distinguish credit risk, market risk and op risk, these three types of risk. We'll start with market price risk. Market price risks uh, or just market risk is the risk type that arises as a result of changes in relevant market prices and can thus lead to losses as a consequence of unfavorable price developments. And these price developments, they occur whenever a good produced or required by a company is traded on the market or on several markets and the price of that uh, uh, of that subject is subject no no on of that uh, good or of that asset I should rather say asset just write down s okay I'm not gonna see this if it's subject to fluctuations so depending on the type of good on the type of asset different forms of market price risk can then be distinguished uh, we have um, First of all, trading market risk, uh, when we have market making, uh, for example, here in um, the case of Deutsche Bank, traded default risk, non-traded marketing risk, market risk. It's not that clear uh, what is meant by this. Actually, you can start with currency risk. If you have currencies uh, and if you have uh, financial positions in a foreign currency, uh, you're, um, you're exposed to currency risks, obviously. For example, if you're a car manufacturer or if you're a bank, uh, if you have an asset, uh, if you produce models in Germany and sell them in Japan, you have production costs in euros that are set against sales in Japanese yen. And if now the exchange rate for the euro against the yen if it changes, the automobile manufacturer will receive higher or lower sales revenues. Uh, and this could be favorable or it could also be detrimental to you. So a very easy remedy would be simply to move production to Europe or to Japan and eliminate currency risk altogether. Then, of course, in financial institutions, we'll think about securities risk and market risk uh, in a strict sense. That is, we have financial securities uh, and Given that they are freely traded on the market, they are always subject to the risk that the market price of that security changes. Um, usually they are all traded on, a, on an exchange, for example, shares, corporate bonds, also certificates on certain indices, EDFs, and they are subject to the risk that prices fall or that prices are volatile and it's difficult to um, predict them. What we can then do is we usually and typically will use uh, statistical methods for modeling market price risk, accurately estimating current and future volatility, and then using these statistical models, assessing potential financial future losses. Um, then next we have interest rate risks. Actually, can delete the one here. Um, interest rate risk is also very relevant to financial institutions and banks. It's the risk of changes in interest rates and um, resulting from these changes are changes um, in the value of a given asset position. The basic prerequisite is that the value of an asset position is a function of a relevant interest rate. Um, simplest example are interest bearing securities, for example, uh, bonds, but also loans granted and sometimes securities whose value is determined by a net present value calculation. And if now these asset positions provide fixed interest payments, uh, you still have, for example, bonds and other debt light securities. Um, if they pay fixed income, they are called fixed income products. 
Um, and even these products, even though the payments are fixed, uh, they are still subject to um, interest rate risk. Why? Because the price and the value of these products is uh, done um, or is based on a net present value calculation and fluctuating market interest rates will lead to an indirect interest rate risk in the form of opportunity costs. Because if you have, for example, if you have bought uh, or if you have given out a loan and the loan pays six, 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 six and one hundred and six percent, uh, this is very nice given the fact that we currently have a zero interest policy by central banks. So the 6% is actually quite high. If you have to pay the 6%, this is quite unfavorable to you. And this is then a risk because of the opportunity costs. So two examples. A bank could have granted a loan at a higher interest rate than agreed. And in this case, the resale value of the loan would change just like the price of a bond would change. And in contrast, if the bank did not sell or assign the loan until maturity, the change in market interest rates would not lead to an immediate loss. In the second example, um, the market interest rate changes in interest bearing securities lead directly to price losses. And the reason for this is that the price of a fixed income security is equal to the net present value of those payments. So again, think about six, six and one hundred and six. How would you calculate the price of a fixed income of a bond that pays out this? Very simple. You divide it by one plus R plus you discount it now with two periods. One plus R squared plus and so on. And this will give you the price. So because of the net present value calculation, if R changes, Looking at a fixed income product will also have an effect on the price. Now, if on the other hand, the interest payments are variable, for example, in the case of a floater, these are called floaters. Um, if the payments are based on market interest rates, such as a three month Euribor, uh, the fluctuating market interest rates generally lead to lower price losses. And the reason is for this is that you have different discounting but you also have different interest payments. So interest payments will go up. You will have different um, discounting and the price changes will be lower. OK, then credit risk. We can distinguish different types of credit risk. Now, if not just a bank, but if any company owns receivables, Forderungen, Auslieferungen und Leistungen, from private persons or another company, the company is exposed to credit risk, the risk that the debtor will not be able to fulfill the claim or only partially. And if you pay too late, if you pay too little, if you don't pay at all, um, you are exposed or this company, your creditor is exposed to credit risk. And this risk of default is generally referred to as credit risk, default risk or counterparty risk. Counterparty risk is has a slightly different touch to it, but credit risk and default risk are interchangeable. Now, credit risk is, of course, the probably the most important type of risk for banks, since banking is based on loan granting. However, each company is exposed to credit risk as long as goods and services are sold on credit. So if you're not a shoe company, a shoe retail store that immediately receives the cash for the pair of shoes. Uh, but if you have receivables, you're also exposed to credit risk. Now, industrial firms also face credit risk. And depending on the industry in which you're operating, credit risk is more or less important. Some companies have rather elaborate company uh, credit risk management departments, for example, energy companies. Some other companies don't have credit risk. Yeah, depends on the industry you're working in. So in the retail sector, credit risk will probably play a minor role. In the case of energy suppliers, you will have receivables from electricity, gas bills from thousands of retail customers and end consumers. So this uh, credit risk management in energy suppliers will usually be carried out in the scope and style of a bank and they will have large risk management departments. We can then distinguish credit risk in the strict and in the broader, actually broader sense. There's again a typo here in the broader sense. Um, credit risk in the strict sense is default, no default. Very simple. One zero, black and white, 
no default or default. Credit risk in the broader sense is a change in the probability of default. So um, you start out saying there's a zero chance of default. And if the zero percent changes to two percent, you also have credit risk. You don't have a default, but you have a slightly more probable um, default. And this is also credit risk. And it's called credit risk in the broader sense. Credit risk in engeren, credit risk in weiteren Sinne. Then let's move to counterparty risk. Uh, these types of credit risk we've seen before, they are related to business relations between a company and the customers. Now, if you enter a business to business uh, contract with another professional market participant, which is then called a counterparty, and if you um, require or if you're uh, entitled to a, a payment, then the risk of failure and default on this payment uh, can happen. And this is called counterparty risk. What does it mean? Um, in a very simple idea, you have a, um, on a very simple example, you will have uh, a derivative contract. In this derivative contract, your counterparty is the other side of the derivative contract. And even if you don't, um, if you haven't paid anything out, but you're expecting payment from that counterparty, if the counterparty defaults and this contract becomes void, then you're facing counterparty risk because suddenly you were expecting to be in a contract and the contract is void. Some varieties of counterparty risk, for example, exactly this example, the replacement risk from derivatives. If the counterparty defaults in a derivative transaction and you have the risk of additional costs when entering into a similar transaction with another counterparty, this is replacement risk in a derivative contract. The issuer risk is the default of issuers of tradable debt or equity securities. If you've bought a bond or a share of a different company, if the company defaults, that's issuer risk. Performance risk, risk that one party fails to perform while the counterparty has already paid up. So you've paid uh, and you're still expecting a certain service maybe from a counterparty. If the counterparty defaults and cannot fulfill that service and offer that service, you have counterparty risk and also country risk. If you've bought uh, a government bond um, and uh, this is also called sovereign risk. If the, comp uh, no, the country defaults, uh, then the government bond becomes uh, worthless. And that's also uh, counterparty risk. Now, counterparty risk has uh, high significance and high importance in the so-called over-the-counter trading of securities. And this kind of securities trading involves direct transactions between two market participants, between two professional market participants, without maybe a stock exchange acting as an intermediary. The advantage of OTC trades is that both counterparties can negotiate uh, um, individual arbitrary conditions while on an exchange, you only have standardized products. The disadvantage of OTC trading is that in the event of the default of the contracting party, the counterparty risk, uh, there is no one that guarantees settlement. That's the problem of OTC trading. You, will have, don't, you don't have an exchange that is responsible for clearing and settling um, the transaction. One possibility to remove counterparty risk, and this became more and more frequent after the financial crisis, is by establishing a central counterparty which takes over the so-called clearing for all market participants. What is clearing? Clearing is the entire process of settling a financial transaction, for example, on a stock exchange, but also in OTC trading. This can include determining and settling mutual claims, liabilities, delivery obligations, uh, transmission and reconciliation of information relevant for processing. And while in OTC trading with central counterparties, the market participants do not enter into transactions directly with each other, but they always indirectly deal with each other via the central counterparty. In this case, you don't obviously have no counterparty risk. Um, a pretty good example for counterparty risk is the case of AIG. AIG was a major market player, uh, market participant in the market for credit default swaps. Uh, credit default swaps are a type of credit derivative in which you swap uh, the default risk. 
and you need, because it's usually an OTC traded contract, uh, you need a counterparty. And it turned out during the financial crisis that um, AIG was a major seller of credit default swaps. Essentially, insurance against the default on assets tied to corporate debt and mortgage securities. And AIG, even though it was a um, an insurance company, was the main market player in the market for credit default swaps. And this uh, made AIG systemically relevant and this caused AIG to be bailed out by the US uh, government, not because of AIG's insurance business. As you can see, millions of insurance policyholders appear to be considerably less at risk, but it was the CDS engagement because of counterparty risk. Okay, now let's turn to uh, credit risk in practice. Um, if you look at the management report, the annual report of DZ Bank, uh, you can see um, the different lending volume by sector in billion euros by uh, the DZ Bank uh, to, for example, financial sector, public sector, corporates, retail, industry conglomerates and others. Very simple. Then we have liquidity risk. Liquidity risk um, arises from um, inflows and outflows of liquidity and cash. Now, the risk we've talked so far, market risk, credit risk, they only have an indirect influence on the continued existence of a company. Why is that? You will face losses, but you can cope with losses. You don't go bankrupt immediately simply because of a financial loss. But at some point, financial losses will be so high that you will face default, that you will face bankruptcy. So the insolvency in the end is triggered by the company's inability, as the name already implies, to be able to meet the company's short term payment obligations. You're illiquid, uh, you're insolvent. And market price risk, credit risk may lead to losses. They only become a threat to the company, to the existence of the company, of the bank, if losses also lead to liquidity risk. And the liquidity of a company is usually defined as the company's ability to fulfill all due obligations at a certain time. The company maintains the ability to settle its short-term debts and liabilities by retaining enough cash or cash equivalent or short-term disposable assets. And liquidity of a company is a prerequisite for continued existence on the market. Illiquidity will be uh, the company's downfall and it will lead to bankruptcy. If the bankruptcy application is not filed with the responsible bankruptcy court, this uh, may fulfill uh, or may lead to um, may qualify as a criminal offense. In German, we call this Insolvenzverschleppung, the delay in filing for bankruptcy. It's not a criminal offense uh, to go bankrupt, but it is a criminal offense if you delay uh, in filing for bankruptcy, uh, and this is called Insolvenzverschleppung, and das ist ein Straftatsbestand. What then is liquidity risk? Liquidity risk is the risk that a company has insufficient liquid funds to sell all short-term liabilities. And it can then rise in the company in two ways. Either you have too little cash for a constant amount of short-term liabilities, or you have the same amount of cash, but suddenly you have higher short-term liabilities. So uh, unexpectedly strong outflow of liquid assets or if cash and cash equivalents remain constant, liabilities can, can become due in the short run, so current need for cash and cash equivalent increases unexpectedly. This is also sometimes called refinancing risk. You need more cash or you need to reduce short-term liabilities. Liquidity risk is of course of importance, uh, of particular importance to banks. Why? Because the core business of a bank involves maturity transformation, taking in short-term deposits and giving out long-term loans. And in the case of a massive withdrawal of short-term customer deposits, what we call a bank run, this can always lead to the immediate bankruptcy of a law. And this is why bank runs, bank stability, represent a central research field in banking. And this is also one of the main reasons for regulating and supervising banks. Now for insurance companies, liquidity risk usually plays a rather 
smaller or um, um, yeah, um, uh, rather small or unimportant role and it's insignificant role. Why? First of all, in an insurance company, you have a constant inflow of cash through cash runs, I think cash flows, um, through premiums. And because you, you don't have massive withdrawals of cash and cash equivalents, uh, which we would consider, uh, and which is actually called an insurance run that usually doesn't happen. Um, that doesn't really happen because you don't, uh, even if you hear that your insurance company is close to bankruptcy, especially non-life insurance, you don't run to your insurance company and cancel your policy. You simply wait out until the policy expires and then look for another company. So insurance run, insurance runs are uh, purely theoretical. There are one or two examples in Australia, but um, they are not really um, that interesting, I think, and very uh, common. Now, this is liquidity risk, and the last type of risk is operational risk. So far, all the types of risk had one thing in common. They were exogenous and they affected the core business of the company. And everyone would have guessed that, yes, we have market risk and we have credit risk. But um, sometimes losses can also arise from exogenous events uh, on areas of a firm that do not belong to the core business or endogenous sources, rather, let's say, internal sources. Um, you, can, you can read this very interesting work on endogenous risk by John uh, Jon Danielson at the London School of Economics. Uh, endogenous risk is maybe slightly different. We should rather call it internal sources of risk, that is, own employees, inadequate internal processes, computer failures, etc. And with Basel II regulation in 2007, uh, Basel II, the framework, uh, thought that regulators thought that, well, we do know about market risk, we do know about uh, credit risk, but something seems to be missing. And this is when they defined operational risk actually rather as a residual of the overall risk of a firm. They said everything that is quantifiable and that is not market risk or credit risk, that should be included in a third bucket. And this third bucket became operational risk. And this is also why the definition entails different types of risk that, that do, uh, they have something in common, but it's, n it's not as coherent as the uh, market or credit risk. Um, <laughs> The definition can actually be found in German law in paragraph 269 of the Solvency Regulation, Solvabilitätsverordnung. Uh, this is the English translation. Operational risk is the possibility of losses arising from inadequate internal procedures, failing internal procedures and systems, people, external events, and it also includes legal risk. So what we see is we have catastrophes, floodings, um, a tsunami is an external event. We have uh, employees stealing from the bank, people uh, failing in internal procedures and systems, that's the rogue trader, uh, but it could also be um, the IT system. If we have a breakdown, you now if we have uh, uh, a complete, complete shutdown of the IT system, that's also operational risk. Um, be careful. Uh, the definition uh, in insurance is slightly different. Uh, this is, for example, done in Solvency 2, which should be seen as uh, uh, the insurance equivalent of, Solven of Basel 2. And you can see operationelle Risiken unter Solvency 2 aus Sicht der deutschen Versicherungswirtschaft are defined as um, also reputational risk, risk of strategic um, um, decisions, um, if they uh, fall into the area of actively um, taking insurance products, they don't fall under operational risk, analogous to Basel II. In Basel II, um, this, is, this is open to debate. So when it comes to reputational risk and strategic risk, they might be included, they might also be excluded. Reputational risk is actually nowadays um, due to efforts by um, Basel, the Basel Committee, but also um, uh, the IAIS in insurance and BaFin reputational risk is also included in operational risk. Okay, 
Now, the most important difference to earlier concepts of operational risk is that it's no longer based on a residual value to other risk types. So it's not just everything else, but it's explicitly listed in uh, the solvency regulation or in solvency two, and therefore general business risk, reputational and legal risk, uh, you can debate this. Business risk, general business risk should not be included in operational risk. Reputational risk, yes, and legal risk, we've seen this. Um, under solvency regulation, it's also included, uh, but you, you can debate this, this is questionable. Now, many operational risks are characterized by the following characteristics. High level of loss, for example, IT failure, a flood, a storm, etc., uh, and a very low likelihood of happening. And thus, it's usually very difficult to measure. What is the probability of a tsunami hitting the headquarters of our company? Very, very unlikely. So that's difficult to measure. Let's go back to the fall of Bering's Bank, and you can see the interaction of various risk factors. We had the lack of or failure of internal control procedures. We had illegal behavior of a single rogue trader, but then we also had the great Hanshin earthquake, so an external event, and all these things came together and they've caused a huge operational risk that caused the bankruptcy of Barings Bank, PLC. Okay, now let's turn to risk measurement. How can we risk uh, measure risk? Usually uh, in financial risk management, it's all about loss distributions or so-called profit and loss distributions. PL is profits and loss distributions. That is, we are modeling the profits and losses of our financial asset positions using statistical distributions. Uh, this should be efficient and this should also be sufficient to adequately depict the risk of an investment. Why? Because we are most concerned about losses. So losses are our focus then let's concentrate on financial losses and their statistical distribution. We can then calculate certain moments of these distributions and we get pecuniary monetary indicators. We get money values. The loss distributions can also be grouped and they can be combined. Uh, you can simply add distributions at each level, say investment, portfolio, subsidiary, company. And you can also model netting and diversification effects. So. Um, and last one, at least you can compare loss distributions to each other. So this all makes measurement of risk using statistical distributions um, very nice uh, and very attractive to us as a risk manager. Um, however, it comes with two disadvantages. First of all, to model those risks, you need data. You need historical data, otherwise you don't have any basis for coming up with the stochastic distribution or the statistical distribution uh, of your financial position. In addition, um, risk measurement with the help of loss distributions uh, includes a huge model risk. Why? You need to choose a risk mapping. You need, um, you need to think about a relevant risk factor. Uh, you need uh, to choose a distributional assumption. And if you make any mistake in modeling, you have model risk. That is the risk that you've chosen the wrong model. However, both arguments against the use of such loss distributions only make a stronger case for adequate, precise modeling. So not the type of modeling is incorrect, but you need to think about coming up with better models. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, it is obviously not yet sufficient to make risks in a company manageable. Uh, we have to deal with the question of what we want to do with a loss distribution. And what then happens is we use key statistics, moments or single values of a loss distribution uh, as a risk measure. Now this is explained in detail in financial risk management and in quantitative risk management at the master's level. Let's assume that this is uh, the loss distribution. You can simply say let's take the mean, let's take the highest loss, let's take a quantile, uh, or let's take the volatility, sigma. Uh, so these are different ways of coming up with risk measures and estimating risk. So you can take the average loss, the expected value. You can take the variance. You can take the maximum loss. All these three measures have serious disadvantages. The expected loss is actually quite, well, let's, 
rather conservative. Let's assume we have usually too high. Um, the highest loss is also way too conservative. It means that in the end, in the long run, we are all dead. So we can every time we can lose everything on every position. That's not sensible if we want to measure economic capital. And variance volatility uh, puts the same emphasis on profits and losses. So it's not even a risk measure. It's not a pure risk measure. So what happens is we concentrate on the so-called value at risk, the VAR. The VAR is, if this is the profits and loss distribution, it's a quantile. If we have 5% probability mass here and 95 here, then this point here is the 5% value at risk. This was included in even very early uh, supervisory law. It has been incorporated into the Solvabilitätsverordnung, the Solvency Regulation, it's Insolvency 2. Um, theoretically, it is not a coherent risk measure. You can learn about this in financial risk management. So it's slightly problematic, but it is the industry standard. It's included in most um, uh, computer programs and statistical um, tools for risk management. And it's defined again as uh, the maximum loss that is only exceeded with a given probability at exactly this probability. So it's only exceeded in 5% of cases and not in 95. So this is the definition. We need a confidence level alpha and value at risk is then uh, given by the smallest number L for which the probability that the loss exceeds L exceeds this number small L is not greater than one minus alpha. In other words, it's a quantile. Uh, it's a quantile. For example, here, it's such a value. The 50% quantile is famously called the median. Uh, we don't use the median, but usually we'll concentrate on the 1% or 2% value at risk. And uh, then if you take confidence level, it's equivalent to the 99 or even 99.5% quantile. In market risk, we usually take 10 days as a time horizon. In credit risk, it's usually one year. You can also use a mean VAR, which simply subtracts the expected loss, but it's a quantile. It is a quantile. It stays a quantile. It's a very simple tool from statistics, but this is famously used in financial risk management as a proxy for the risk. And you can see how it makes sense if we go back to our toy example of a bank's balance sheet. Oh, I have to switch back a lot of slides. Uh, look at what I've done here. Where is it? Here. Uh, to calculate our uh, risk exposure, the risk weighted assets, what did I do? I took the complete whole credit risk exposure and I multiplied it with 5%. And I could also say, well, not let's not look at 5% times 10,000. Let's simply say here, Let's use the 99% VAR of loans. And then I could calculate the 99% VAR of our loan exposure on the balance sheet. And I would get maybe 500, 800 or 700. And this is how value at risk got so prominent and so famous because regulators and supervisors based uh, the calculation of uh, regulatory capital in internal models, in internal ratings-based approach uh, models on the value at risk. And because it was allowed by supervisors to be used for calculating economic capital, banks used and since then have used the value at risk extensively. So that's why value at risk is nowadays the industry standard because it was is accepted by regulators to calculate your risk-weighted assets and your risk exposure. Okay, so that's the definition. And uh, usually in practice, you have 99 or 99.5%. <laughs> Banks will actually uh, calculate the value at risk um, and report on the value at risk estimates 
in their risk report. And as you can see here, these are the different VARs for say interest rate credit, uh, risk, um, interest rate risk, credit spread risk, equity risk, foreign exchange and commodity risk. And um, you see the development of these risk forecasts and during some times they decreased and yes, time uh, variation in your risk exposure. Okay, now again, the value risk is theoretically not very appealing because it's not coherent. If you're more interested in this, please have a look at the financial risk management class. But here it suffices to say that it uh, is meant to be that um, it does not possess the pro uh, property of sub-additivity. Sub-additivity means that if you have two loss positions, L1 and L2, uh, and the risk measure is new, new of L1 plus L2, that is the risk of the diversified portfolio has to be smaller or equal than the sum of the two individual risks. And new can be understood as the VAR, or it could also be understood as regulatory capital. And this is simply the idea of diversification. If we have a portfolio that is diversified, then we expect this portfolio to require less regulatory capital as if we were simply to sum up the two individual capital amounts. And this property is not given for valued risk. For valued risk, it might be that it's actually larger for the diversified portfolio and this is not realistic. We would assume that in a portfolio, we will always see diversification. And that's not the case for some statistical distributions with valued risk. You can then go on and extend the valued risk. And because of these disadvantages, um, you can extend it to the so-called expected shortfall. Expected shortfall is defined as follows. You take a loss, you need uh, the expected absolute loss to be small, uh, to be finite, and then expected shortfall for a confidence level alpha is defined as the weighted integral over the quantile function. QU is the quantile function. It looks weird, and you don't need to interpret this, but uh, first of all, you can see as a first observation that expected shortfall is sort of a mean var. Uh, it, if this is the profit and loss distribution and you have different VARs, it means that the expected shortfall is somehow an average of these VARs. And this is exactly the best interpretation. Actually, it turns out if the variable L, the distribution, is integrable uh, with a continuous distribution, expected shortfall is the expected loss conditional on the losses being larger than the valued risk. So let's now switch from a profit and loss distribution to a loss distribution and a Verlustverteilung, which looks like this. So the losses are in this direction. And if this is the VAR, what is the expected shortfall? The expected shortfall is simply the average of these points here. So it's the conditional expected loss under the condition that the losses are larger than the VAR, that they exceed the VAR. You can see two main properties. First of all, the expected shortfall is coherent. The coherence of VAR is only given for elliptical distributions like the normal or the T distribution, but expected shortfall is always coherent. And the nice thing is here, in this area, we have what we call tail risk. It's the risk of an extreme loss in the tail of the distribution. And expected shortfall measures tail risk, whereas valued risk doesn't. Hmm? So these are the two nice features uh, of uh, expected shortfall. So if you take valued risk and expected shortfall, we have talked about the need to check the validity and adequacy of your risk models. And this is actually backtesting. Backtesting is defined as the process of quality assessment of a risk model based on historical data. And in the case of VAR backtesting, you are comparing the estimated VARs with the actual realized losses. And this is why, for example, Deutsche Bank does this for example, if you now have these expected 
uh, if you have these estimated VAR forecasts, you can also look at the uh, actual losses. So let's look at it like this. And if they cross it like this, then we would say this is a VAR exceedance, this is a VAR exceedance, and this is a VAR exceedance or a VAR hit. On these days, we saw that we had a higher lo a loss that was higher than the value of risk. Uh, losses go in this direction. Okay. Now, what this would also mean that if we were to write it as a sequence of zeros and zeros and ones, this would look like this. Okay. Let's this. Okay. And this is the sequence of so-called var hits or var exceedances, var hits, var exceedances, that you need to check. Um, if this is, actually I don't know whether this is the 1% or 0.5% var, let's assume we have, this is one year, let's assume we have 250 days and this is the 10 percent var. How many hits would you expect? Now a question for you before we'll probably run out of time for today. What is the number of expected var hits or var exceedances? If these are 250 days, if these are daily var estimates and we have the 10 percent var. Now we would expect No one. Twenty-five. How many do we have? Actual. One, two, three. So obviously, uh, the risk model can be any good. We are expecting twenty-five exceedances, and we only have three. If now this were to look like this. The var hit sequence would look probably like this, with this here. It would look like this. And so on. It might be that the number is correctly specified, but obviously we have clustering of those hits. So the two things we would be looking for in var back testing is, first of all, the correct number. of hits and temporal uh, independence, aka ra randomness, let's call it randomness of those hits over time. Huh? Okay, so this is backtesting. You check the validity of your risk model by taking up standard tests, for example, Christophers and Pelletier test. Um, we get this variable, um, this indicator variable of those VAR violations. You assume that it's binomially distributed and you check whether you have the right number and you have temporal independence. Okay. Now we are almost out of time and I think we've covered a lot of ground today. So I would say we stop here before going into the details of some hedging strategies. So do you have any questions concerning risk management, risk types? and measuring risk. Any questions? No one's writing in the chat window. So I would say thank you very much for your attention. Have a nice evening and uh, see you next week. Thank you.